God is. God is a good God. He's a great God. He'll do anything but fail. He has so many mountains out of my way. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you for this privilege to come, Father God, and, and hear from you through your word. We know in times past, Father God, you have spoke through men, to men directly. And now we know, Father God, that you speak to us through your word and your word alone. We ask you, Father God, to continue to bless us to hear your word that your word will tell us, teach us, and strengthen us. Lord, we ask you to bless us now as we come to approach your word, that your word will fall on good soil, that we will be made the better because of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray that you keep the glory, all on and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. So many mountains from the right up my way Wonderful God. Come on, let's sing together. God is. God is a good God. And he's a great God. He can do everything. He can do everything but fail. He can do anything but fail. He has moved out of my way. God we serve is the wonderful, he is the wonderful God, and we're here tonight to give him glory again for trusting us with his word, amen? amen. Our, our lesson tonight will be coming from Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, last week we covered verses 1 through 11, tonight we will look to cover verses 12 through 18. Is that correct? Last week, verses 1 through 11? Amen. Week before last. Thank you, Brother Whitlock, for covering the Bible study last week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As I was diving into the books, you, you covered it for me. Thank you so much. So two weeks ago, that is, we went to Philippians chapter 1. We covered verses 1 through 11. Tonight, we're looking at verses 12 through 18. What was the homework assignment that you had two weeks to do a one week assignment? What was your homework assignment? Philippians chapters 1 and 2. What, what was the assignment concerning Philippians chapter 1 and 2? To read chapters 1 and 2, comma, write something about it, comma, and Look up some words, or you mean tell us what it meant to you, or like journal and that kind of care no? Yeah, that's what we talked about. So, so you had 14 days to do a seven-day assignment. Is that right? That's called grace and mercy. Now, the question is, did you take advantage of the grace and the mercy? Did you or did you not? Anybody? Any takers? Any takers took advantage? So we read Philippians chapters 1 and 2. We covered Philippians chapter 1 through 11. And tonight we're looking at chapters 1 through 12, 12 through 18 rather. And it's going to be an easy task for me to cover because you have covered it several times. Amen. Let's talk about verses 1 through 11. Who is the writer, who's the author here of Philippians, the book of Philippians? Paul, right? And he is accompanied by someone. Who is that person? Timothy, Timothy right? You asking me? Timothy. Timothy, okay. So when, when he talks about the apostle Paul and Timothy or with Timothy, 
He is concerned that you understand that it is these two men that he's referring to as bond servants, as servants of God, okay? He's not referring to Timothy as the co-author, but he's saying that these are the ones who are servants or bond servants to Jesus Christ. You see that in verse number one, right? So these are bond servants. What does this phrase bond servant mean? Bond servants. Bond servants. Slave. A slave to, to Jesus Christ. I say to you, if you are not a slave to Jesus Christ, you are a slave to the devil. If you think that you're not a slave at all, you are a slave to something or somebody. Amen. Some people are slaves to their children. Some people are slaves to their spouses. Some people are slaves to their associates, their friends, their family members. Some people are even slaves to folk they ain't even married to. Got a ball and a chain on their neck and their leg. You're a slave to something and somebody. Some people are even slaves to stuff. Name some of the stuff that people are enslaved to. Money. Money. Cell phone. Pride. Pride. So we are slaves to something, and some of us are slaves to somebody. So we always want to be slaves to Jesus Christ, right? We ought to be servants and bond servants to Jesus Christ. We ought to be one to you be yoked to Jesus, yoked to him. And when we're yoked to him, then we are, we, are, we are of God and we're walking with God. So is it a problem being a slave to Jesus? No, it's not. Slave is considered a nasty term, right? When you use the word slave, what is the first thing you think about? Master. Master. Massa, what's the first thing comes to your mind when you, you hear the word slave? Evil, work, and slavery. Slavery. What do we? What do we? When we talk about slavery, what do we? What are we really saying? You're not your own. You can't do what you want to do. When we talk about slavery, what, what do we think slavery? When we think slavery, where? What what geographical location we think about? Yeah. Where? United States. United States. United States of America. Okay. Okay. So is that a is that a good memory for us? Is that a good memory for any of us? No. Okay. Well, many have used the Bible to to uh, say that God supports it. Are we not using the Bible to say that God supported because we don't like slavery? Or we're not using the Bible to say that God supported because it's, it's not, God is not in support of it? Definitely not in support of it. Okay, we think God is not in support of it. Okay. You can't mistreat people. So we have to treat people how we want to be treated, right? Okay, so let's look at this. So if we are slaves to Jesus Christ, are we a bond servants? Are we a servant to Jesus Christ? Jesus being our master is going to look out for us. When we think about slavery in the United States of America, our masters as slaves, the master is looking out for who? For himself. Matter of fact, you're not really a human being. You are a piece of property. But when it comes to Jesus, we are human beings, and he wants us to grow stronger spiritually, stronger physically, stronger in our relationships, right? So we are slaves to Jesus Christ, and Jesus wants us to be our very, very best. Amen? So Paul the author is accompanied by Peter, I mean about Timothy, and he says we are bond servants to Jesus Christ. Who does he write to? Verse number one, he's writing to the saints in Philippi, right? He's writing to the saints, and these saints are particular saints. They are saints in Jesus Christ. They are saints in Jesus Christ. So he's writing to them, and he's, he's, he also specifies two others. What two groups do he specify other than the saints? So he's writing to the congregation, 
And he's also writing to bishops, bishops and the, deacons. the bishops and the deacons. And I said uh, before, two weeks before, I said to you there are two official offices in the church, the pastor and the deacon, and somebody cringed. Mm. Why, why would I say that, and why would, why would you cringe? Because for many years, we thought that the official offices of the church were like leaders of ushers, leaders of deacons, leaders of, of the choir. You know, we thought those were, p p p p those were particular offices. That's why at our church, everybody is a servant leader. Why a servant leader? Because we are servants to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he or she who leads ought to be the strongest in serving. Are you with me? So we are servant leaders and we lead as we are the strongest in service. Deacons. First of all, let's look at the word, the word bishop. The word bishop is the overseer. Not the one in charge, but the one who has been given charge. The overseer is not the one who's in charge, but he has been given charge. Jesus is in charge. He has given pastors the charge to lead. So at the New Beginning Church, I have been given charge. And Jesus Christ is still in charge. Whenever church dismiss Jesus Christ as the person in charge, then it's no longer a church. It's a social club. It's a clique. It's a game. It is heresy. It is not of God. Whenever Jesus is no longer in charge, that building, that group of people are not the church any longer. Then it talks about deacon. Deacon, a deacon is not a person who controls the past. Say, oh, some, some another. He is not the liaison between the people and the pastor. Oftentimes when pastors do things and people disagree with them, they go to, people go to the deacon and say, how y'all let him do that? Thank God we don't have that at the New Beginning Church. How y'all let him do that? How y'all let him do that? Y'all just weak men because y'all didn't set him straight. Well, the word deacon comes from the, the Greek word diakone. It too means servant. This word means servant, and so every deacon is to serve. He is a servant. He is a waiter. Do you have to be a deacon to serve? I'm grateful for the men of this church and the fact that they serve without being called a deacon, without the title of deacon. They say, if you don't call me by my title, I ain't going to do nothing. Okay, I won't call you at all. Because the fact of the matter is, the greatest title that you can ever have is not pastor, is not reverend, it's not apostle. It's not prophet. It is servant. Jesus says, servant, well done. Thy good and faithful servant. Let me tell you, if you don't hear those words, you can forget about the rest. <laughs> you can be called whatever you want to be called on planet Earth, but you need to be called a servant. So you need to be a servant. So deacons are servants. He says, grace and peace to you in the name from our Father, God the, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. This word grace means acceptance. 
means favor. God has accepted us. Thank God that he's accepted us. When I was growing up as a boy, many times my brothers would not choose me on their team, either because I was too skinny or too weak. Or I didn't shoot big enough, but I didn't shoot well enough. I didn't run fast enough. Or I didn't hit hard enough. Many times, even my brothers wouldn't let me on their team. My younger brothers wouldn't let me on their team. Until the other boy twisted his ankle then, hey man, come on. But I'm grateful to God that God has me on his team. That means much to me. It means more to me that God has me on his team than it means for me to be on their team. Now you've covered chapters one and two. Give me some, uh, give me some notes that you have, <laughs> that you have made from verses one through 11. What are some of the notes that you made for verses one through 11? I'm so glad we have studious students. Yes, ma'am. You're first. Everybody's waiting on you now. Yes, ma'am. It's always the person that's looking around. <laughs> Who's first? Tell me what you got. Okay, I made a note on, on verse number six. Verse number six. Anybody got anything before verse number six? Um, yeah, he's, uh, Paul is thankful for them when he thinks about them. He, he, Paul is thankful for this church at Philippi. Why is he thankful for them? Because they supported him. For their support. How did they support him? When he was in prison. When he was in prison, how did, how did he support them prior to prison? How did they support him prior to prison? He gave them money. They partnered in the gospel. They partnered with him in the gospel. Meaning they prayed for him, and not only did they pray, they supported him financially. Thank God for folk who pray for the preacher and support the preacher financially. You don't have to raise your hand, but are you praying for the preacher? Are you supporting the preacher financially? What's another point that you wrote down? Not only did they support him when he wasn't in jail, when he was in jail, they supported him. So they supported him while he was locked up. He really loved them. Say again? He really loved them. He loves them because they supported him. Even Let me tell you something. When somebody supports you while you're in jail, that's, that's real love then. Yeah. They put money on his books. <laughs> Y'all know something about prison. I see. <laughs> they put money on his books. I see. <laughs> what does it mean to have money on your books? What does that mean? You can get some stuff. You can get toiletries. You can get toothpaste. You, you, you can get stuff that you got. What, what happened to the guys that has nobody to put money on their books? They just suffer. It's always good to have a friend when you're in need. Don't take advantage of your friends. And please don't take for granted your friends. Everybody needs a friend and everybody needs a spiritual friend. Your friends are not those who agree with everything you do. That's another thing I thank people for at the New Beginning Church. They don't, they don't agree with everything I do. I'm grateful for that. They don't agree with everything I do. Isn't that something? I'm thankful for them. Because sometimes I can be a knucklehead. Is that why you raise your hand and tell me? <laughs> yes, ma'am. You know, if, if you've got true love for a person, you don't let them get away or to say anything or do anything that can make you feel that's not right. So if you know that they're not right, you tell them. You go to them, not to go and tell everybody else. Okay. Tell them. So if you tell somebody else, that means you don't love me. No, that means you got me. <laughs> that means you got me, not me. Well, I don't mean that. Uh oh, okay. I'm just, I'm going to make sure we're on the same page here. No, no, I'm so, not saying, I'm not saying. So your point is, when you really love somebody, you don't just agree with everything they say no. and everything they do. And if right, you, you, you go to them. Okay, so Matthew 18 says, if you have a problem with a brother or sister, you go to them. How do you go to them? 
one on one. Get it straight. What's another note you have? So he's thankful for them and he's always praying for them. What's another note you have, verses 1 through 11? We have verse 3 right now. Hmm? Okay, where are we now? Tell me, just tell me your notes. They support him. Yeah, he had love for them. That's what they were talking about. That was. Uh, they have love for him. He has love for them. He so has love for them. Obviously, they have love for him. Because mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you, people don't support you when they ain't got love for you. When they don't have love for you, they they use this phrase under their breath: "I can show you, but I can tell you." We got some members like that to do the beginning church. I can show you, better than I can tell you. Just make sure that you're making the right decision while you're showing it. Okay, Sister so David, you had something at verse number 11. Okay, verse number six. Number six. Tell me about verse number six. Uh, verse six talks about God who began a good work in you. He's going to complete it to the day of Jesus Christ when he returns. And sometimes that uh, when we start projects or something like that, we start with great enthusiasm and then as we go on, our zeal kind of sort of fades and the work kind of sort of fizzles out, but God is not like that. Whatever God starts in us, he's going to make sure that we finish it. So what God has started in us, he will complete it until the day of redemption. Right, but check this out. First thing that God has started in us is salvation. The greatest miracle that one would ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. The saving of a lost soul is the greatest miracle that you will ever experience. Greater than deliverance from your sin, salvation is the greatest miracle. Because in salvation, one gets deliverance from their sin. Because in order to have sanctification, you've got to have salvation. Then he talks about until the day of redemption, that's glorification. So God has, start, God has started a great work in us spiritually through salvation. Everybody who has trusted Jesus Christ to get them from earth to glory have salvation. Everybody who has trusted the story that Jesus died for your sins, buried, rose, and was seen, that person that has trusted Jesus Christ, God has begun a good work in you. Not only that, he has begun a good work in us also in the fact that we do things for God and with God that we wouldn't normally do if we wasn't saved. You see, you don't work to be saved. You work because you're saved. God has begun a good work in you. It's really a great work in you. You remember how you used to be? You hate to even think about it, don't you? Boy, how I used to be. I just, I don't even, I mean, I don't even want it to cloud my mind. But God has Change me. God has begun a great work in me. That's why I can't point my finger at other people because if it wasn't for God doing a great work in me, I wouldn't be where I am. What's the next note you have? Boy, y'all sure are teaching tonight, man. Let, let's get more than two people teaching now. <laughs> Say what? Oh, maybe only two people did their homework. Oh, my goodness. God has begun a good work in us. And, and God will complete that work in us. Look at verse 7. Who has a note on verse number 7? He's still talking about them, them and the love they share for each other. They have a special place in their heart. I thank God that the members of the New Beginning Church, all of them, have a special place in my heart. And there's nothing like it, the place that you have in my heart. I, like Paul, think about you regularly. I, like Paul, pray for you regularly. I, like Paul, have a special place just for you in my heart. Not in my mind. 
Thank God you have a special place in my heart. Verse number eight. What is Paul talking about? He says, God is my witness. God is the one on the witness stand. God is the one that can prove what I'm saying to you is true. What else does he say? He says, God is my witness. Say again. He has an affection for them. Affection. What is that affection? What is that? Has affection for them. Has love for them. He's just driving home this thing of love. He's driving it home. That's why we have to love people. We can't beat people to get them to the Lord. We love them to the Lord. We show them love even when we disagree. We show them love even when our love is not what they deserve. Say again. Because only love can change the people that fill up by. Amen. Love changes us. Have you ever heard of frangelism? Frangelism? What is frangelism? It's when you evangelize friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. It's all built around relationship. The relationship we have between each other and among each other, that's what gets us to see love for each other. We love each other. We love. We, we really have a... You can't fake love too long. It's just got to be real love. So, in return, ask the question, what does love have to do? The reason why Tina asked that question, Sister David knows one secular song. You <laughs> <laughs> said what now? <laughs> she knows one secular song... All through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 20s, she has, she know in the, in the 2000s, she knows one secular song, and it is what love got to do with it. Let me just tell you, Tina Turner, after being beat up, being thrown out, being dragged, being punched in public, and several nosebleeds, she asked the question, what love got to do with it? Because love is an action word. And when you really love somebody, you don't punch them, kick them, drag them, and embarrass them. Eat cake. Eat cake, Eat cake. You go eat something, it's cake. It was something, but it wasn't love. <laughs> Boy, every woman, every woman, if they don't remember anything else, they remember two things. Tina Turner shaking her tail feather. And they remember, eat the cake, Eddie, man, eat the cake, eat the cake. You ain't this cake. Why women remember that? Because it was not an exemplary issue of love, was it? It, is, it did not exemplify love. See, love make you do stuff for people, not against people. Paul said this. God is my witness. I have great affection for you. I really love you. He drives this home. Verse number nine. What does he say in verse number nine? What do your notes say from verse number nine? Thank y'all so much for teaching tonight. Thank y'all so much. What, what did y'all say about verse number nine? In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment. Number one, he wants you to keep the affection going, keep the love going. Have you heard of paying it forward? It means you do something for somebody, you don't even have to know them. You do something for somebody that's good and will be beneficial to them. But at the same time, that person is not to return the favor to you, they are to pass it on to somebody else. It's called paying it forward, right? And so when you pay it forward, what Paul is saying here, continue to do what you're doing, but always have quality knowledge, understanding the word well, and be discerning in what you do. 
Some people can look at a rascal and say, he ain't no good. The Lord has given them discernment. He didn't have to do anything wrong. He didn't have to say anything out of the way. But the moment they show up, their spirit connects with them and says, nah, something wrong with this rascal. Never will forget, I took a girl home and uh, the girl was a righteous girl. I mean, I thought she was anyway. And uh, it was before black folks started wearing weeds and wigs that was pretty. And she had coal black hair. And when she walked in there, I said, look, you need to get rid of that girl with that black hair. With that fake hair on. I mean, I said, daddy, she grew that from the root. He said, oh, I don't want to hear that. So the hair wasn't the issue. He, has, he had peeped her card, and he knew she wasn't any good. And he had me to focus. I'm focusing on the hair because he mentioned hair. He done looked all down through her, her, her inner be being. Discernment. Can see stuff other folk can't see. Can recognize it afar off. That, 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 that ain't no good. So, Davis, you want to tell us something about discernment? <coughs> Some people can discern even from a picture. Some people can make a discernment even from a picture. When Sister Davis' daddy saw my picture, he said, now that's the one. <laughs> Is that what he said? <laughs> nah, I'm just joking. <laughs> I showed him a picture of another guy who looked at that picture and said, that guy is a rascal. Discernment, even over a picture. <laughs> Are you with me? So, so God has a way of giving us a spirit of discernment where we can see things that other folk won't even imagine. And we try to come to the defense of jokers and say, well, he, he's all right. He hasn't done anything. It's like, it's like a girl that, that everybody can see that he's not for her, but she doesn't understand it. She just thinks the world of him. 10 and 11, talk, talk to me what you know say. Verses 10 and 11. So y'all didn't get that far, huh? He wants them to live, live clean, blameless lives. Now, when we live blameless lives, is that a life of perfection? Well, you do know the Bible said, be ye perfect as God is perfect. What is he really saying? Be mature, be complete. Be complete. The word, the Greek word is complete. Be complete. And, and whatever you do, give it, give it your very best. Give it your very best. Give it your all. Be complete. So that God will get the praise and God will get the glory. Amen? Let's look at verses 12 through 18. But I want you to know, brethren, that things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Look at Paul. Paul is saying, even though I've been beat, even though I've been shipwrecked, even though I've been put in prison, it has caused the gospel to go forward. Can you come to that conclusion? Even the stuff I've been through, it has caused the gospel, it has caused the gospel to go forward. In other words, death can be on your agenda, but you're willing to die for the cross. Paul says, what the devil meant for evil, God has turned it around for good. There are some people that are divorced right now. God just looked out for them. Even though you thought the best of him, the best of her, even though the, the, sweet, the sweet vegetable was sweet and you thought it was sweet and it went bad, God looked out for you. What you thought was bad, God has turned it into good. Just think, Sister Richard, you wouldn't have that tall, dark, handsome fella there. God has turned it out for good. <laughs> 
Be thankful, Sister Richard. <laughs> Be thankful. Well, look what God has done. Paul says, in all that I have done, all that I've been through, all that's going on around me, all that's still happening to me, God has turned it around for good. Isn't that something? He says, God has turned it out for the furtherest of the gospel. And not only did he turn it around for good, the gospel has been promoted because of it. Remember the sermon I preached, I said to you that um, it was good that I was afflicted. If I had not been afflicted, then God wouldn't have, get the, wouldn't have gotten the glory. So the things that we go through, just make sure God gets the glory. Even in the good and the bad, let's make sure that God receives the glory, that the gospel is fatherless, for the fatherless of the gospel. Verse number, number 13. So that it has become evidence to the whole palace God. What he's saying is the whole palace gods. What is a God? I didn't say G-O-D. G-U-A-R-D, the guard, right? The whole palace of what? Security officers, law enforcement. Paul has made a difference in being locked up. He has made a great difference even to those who have charge over him. And they know why he's locked up. And they know why he's locked up. In other words, you ought to be able to make a difference even to your superior. You ought to be able to make a difference to your enemies for the followers of the gospel. For the followers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to the rest that my chains are in Christ. In other words, he has not only made a difference to the guards, he's made a difference to the rest of them that's chained up with him. Anybody in this house? You see, when you're on the same plane as other people, you ought to really, really be able to make a difference so they can see Christ in you. Do your coworkers see Christ in you? Do your neighbors see Christ in you? And for those of y'all that play bingo, do your bingo players see Christ in you? When you go to Zonico, do they see Christ in you? Do the people that surround you, the people that are associated with you, do they see Christ in you? You got to check yourself. He says, even in chains, they see that I'm in Jesus Christ. <laughs> locked up, locked down. Paul had a determination to reflect Christ in everything he did. We must be determined that men, women, boys, and girls will see Jesus Christ in what we do, how we act, where we go, our attitudes. People ought to see Christ. One woman had, uh, she had a, some kind of shop where she showed, sold stuff. A guy walks in with a gun, said, give me your money. She said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my shop. I'm not giving you anything. And she just kept calling on the name of Jesus. He had a gun in his hand, pointing it at her. She said, in the name of Jesus, get out of my shop. I'm not giving you anything. I worked for this. God has blessed me with this. In the name of Jesus, get out of my shop. Criminal turned his head, ran out the door with great speed, and got out of the show. If it was you, would he have the money? Or would he have Jesus? <laughs> you can raise your hand now. I can get the little money. He would have had that money. <laughs> 
would he have the money or would he have Jesus? The lady said she couldn't afford to give him her money. She worked for her money. So she called on Jesus. Police officers would tell you and I confer. <laughs> Let him have the money. But offer him Jesus. Paul says, in chains they can see me in Christ. In chains while I'm locked up. And he says, most of verse number 14, Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, in most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confidence, confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They see, see, see Paul locked up. They see Paul in his chain. They see Paul in his, his bad way. Now, first of all, most of us wouldn't be talking about writing a letter. You know, we can hear Nero's chopping block outside. They're sharpening up for our necks. Are you with me? Paul knew that Nero's chopping block would be cutting his neck off. Paul knew he was going to die because of the gospel. He took time in the midst of being on his death row. He took time on death row to write us a letter. What would you be thinking? <laughs> Your last few hours of living, what would you be thinking? Would you be writing a letter? You wouldn't be writing a letter to, to the saints, would you? <laughs> would you be writing a letter that we would be reading about 2,000 years later? Okay, what would your letter say? What would your letter say, brother? What, what would your letter say? To my lovely wife. <laughs> I enjoyed the time we spent together. <laughs> brother Miles, what, your what would your letter say? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> would you be writing it to us? I don't know. Would you be writing to the deacons? Would you be writing to the, to the, to the pastor? Would you be writing to the bishops? I don't know until I get to that, to that spot. <laughs> so Paul didn't even doubt what he was going to do. He, he knew he was going to rejoice in the Lord. And because of Paul's testimony, guess what? Other men who spoke the word of God has become bold. Men in prison became bold, and men outside of prison became bold. Because of Paul confidence in the Lord. If you're going to die, you might as well die in the Lord. You might as well die rejoicing for the Lord. Let me serve you notice, you're going to die. If the Lord's tarry, if the Lord's tarry, you're going to get out of here. You got to let your life count for something. Paul let his little light shine. He let it shine, he let it shine. Every way he went, even in prison, he let his light shine. We sing this little pretty song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. All in my home, I'm going to let it shine. We don't even sing that part that said, in the prison jail cell, I'm going to let it shine. I mean, it's good to let it shine in my church, in my neighborhood, in my home. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's good for shouting, but it's not good for living by. Especially when you're on death row. He says, others have gained confidence. They have become bold and they're sharing the gospel without fear because of my testimony. Isn't that something? Let me tell you, people are watching you and they're watching how you carry yourself. They're walking, watching how you handle trials and tribulations. Do you just give up on the Lord? Do you just shut down church activities? Do you just stop coming to church because you're going through something? Or do you press your way through? Press your way through. Shout your way through. Praise your way through. Let me tell you, we need some folk that's willing to press their way. You got to press your way. You got to be like the woman in Mark chapter 5 who had an issue of blood 
and she didn't let tradition and religious sanction, sanctimonious activity stop her from getting to Jesus. You got to press your way through. Some people let a bipolar fella come to town and they, they had to miss church just to hear Kanye. Are you with me? But you have to learn to press your way through. And look at verse 15. Paul says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. He says, some preachers are preaching Christ from envy and strife. Let's look at the word envy. Envy, spite. Envy, distraction. Envy, ill will. They preach Christ with ill will. And then strife, contention, debate. So some preachers are preaching with the wrong motive, with the wrong mindset. I'm sure we don't have that anywhere in Houston, but some preach for the wrong motives. Then he says, and some also from goodwill. But watch what he says in verse number 16. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition. Not sincerity. Supposing to add a fiction to my chains. Let's unpack that. He says the former preach. What does he mean when he said the former? We go back up to the previous verse. The former means the first, right? The first group that's preaching through, through, through envy and strife, they are preaching for selfish ambition. They're preaching for themselves that they will gain something. They are not sincere in their preaching. And then finally he says, they are supposing, they are preaching to cause affliction to me. Look at, look at that. Can you believe, I, I know you can't imagine this because you've never seen this, where you got a group of preachers that's preaching to make things bad for another preacher. A group of preachers who, who preach for envy through envy and strife, and Paul says they are preaching to make things bad, make matters worse for me. I'm already locked up. I'm already going to die. And they are preaching so they can make matters worse for me. And he says, but, verse 17, but, what does but do? What does but do? It eliminates what's said before then. It takes a turn in a different direction. And it tells us something that's contradictory for, for what I just said. He says, but the latter preach out of love. The latter preach out of love. Knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So you got one group of preachers that's preaching to cause pain and affliction to Paul. You do know what one preacher says affects another. <laughs> Paul says, they causing me affliction. And then he says, but there's another group. Thank God for the other group. He says, there's another group. Thank God for the other group. This other group here, they are preaching out of love. They are preaching knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The word here is apologetics. Apologetics does not mean that you go and apologize and say I'm sorry. The word apologetics means that I'm here to defend the gospel. First Peter says it like this. Always be ready to give an account of what convictions you have in your heart. Always be ready to give 
an answer to what you believe within. Always be ready. He says, Paul says, there's a group of men who are preaching. And when they preach, they are preaching out of love because they know that I'm here defending the gospel. Are you with me? Verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretent, in other words, whether they're preaching out of envy or strife, it really doesn't matter. Whether they're preaching out of pretent, pretense, or whether they're preaching in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I'm going to rejoice. He says, in this, I am rejoicing right now. And then Paul gets happy. He says, yes! And I will rejoice. <laughs> he says, first of all, he says, first of all, I rejoice because when, they, as long as they are preaching Christ, regardless of their motives, as long as they're preaching Christ, I'm rejoicing. He says, as long as they're preaching Christ, I'm rejoicing. And then he says, yes, I'm going to rejoice. Hallelujah. That's what he said. He says, I know that there are some men that are preaching out of ill will. They're preaching out of envy and strife. They are messed up in their preaching but there's another group, and this group is preaching out of love, and they are supporting my defense of the gospel. And because it is preaching the Christ that I represent, because it is preaching Jesus the Christ, because they are preaching the gospel, I'm rejoicing right now. And then he says, yes, not only am I rejoicing, he says, yes, I will rejoice. Paul says that not only am I going to have joy, I'm going to have joy over and over again. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to continue to joy. I'm going to continue to show forth joy. Question to you tonight, are you rejoicing? Paul in prison. Paul in chains. Paul being held down by gods. He says, and I know there are some preachers doing wrong stuff. They're preaching with the wrong motive. They're preaching ill will. They're preaching envy and strife. They have a wrong attitude of their preaching. But thank God for there's a group. Thank God for that group that's preaching out of love, that support my defense of the gospel. He says, I'm going to rejoice. Matter of fact, I'm rejoicing now, and yes, I will rejoice question tonight is, will you rejoice? Well, will you continue to rejoice? Yes, sir. One of the reasons Paul is rejoicing is because he also says it's going to turn and it shall lead to his, his salvation. Mm -hmm. So as we rejoice, as others see us in our tough times, and we rejoice, it does lead to salvation of others. Are you with me? We have to get to a point where we can rejoice in all things, where we can celebrate in all things. No, we don't, we don't, we don't, we're not, a, we don't rejoice because we're going through. We rejoice as we go through. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and because we rejoice as we go through, God is able to show us a picture of us and how we rejoice as we go through. Other folks see it. And it further the gospel. So you ought to get excited every now and then. And said, in the, in the midst of this, I'm going to have joy. In the midst of this, I'm going to rejoice. And not only am I rejoicing right now, I am going to continue to rejoice. Because it is for the furtherance of the gospel. Hallelujah. Any questions or comments? Questions or comments? Homework assignment. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. 
Chapters 1, 2, and 3 is your homework assignment. Philippians chapters 1, 2, and 3. And I want more than two peoples to have two people to halfway take it seriously this time. I mean, you, you had a week. It turned into two weeks. And guess what? We had two half of the people that did half of their work. We'll pick up verse 19 and do that for Rickaby next time. We'll start at verse 19 next time and do that for Rickaby. Now, look, don't try to fool me. Don't read verses 19 to wherever the Rickaby ends because, you know, we, we want to get a good flavor from the word, right? And we want to do, Paul says, that we ought to do our very best regardless of what we're going through and regardless of what we do. Are you with me? So do your very best. Study the word. The Bible says in Hebrews that in time past, God spoke to us through his prophets. But in this present day, he speaks to us through his word. If you're not studying the word, God is not speaking to you. You got all these people running around talking about, I got a rhema word from the law. Just read your Bible and get your word. <laughs> you don't need anybody to speak any word into your life. You, you got a pastor for that. Just read the Bible and, and watch what God does. Amen? So we begin at verse 19, and we'll take that for Rick Appeal next week. Your homework assignment is, is uh, Philippians chapters 1, 2, and 3. And what you're going to do with that. Matter of fact, Philippians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. four. You had 1, 2, and 3 this time, right? No, we just had 1 and 2. Oh, y'all had 1 and 2? Okay, this time you got 1, 2, 3, and 4. You already done 1 and 2, right? Yeah. You did do 1 and 2, right? Yeah. Okay, so homework assignment. Homework assignment is Philippians 1, 2, 3, and 4. We've already completed number 1, 2, right? And so what we're going to do is make sure that we look at it, we summarize it, we journal it from day to day, we make sure we get a good flavor of it and come prepared to, to, uh, to assist in the, in the facilitation next time. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord, and we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you will do and what you're doing right now. Lord, we glorify you, we magnify you. We thank you, Father God, that you are able to take bad stuff and turn it into good stuff for the furtherance of the gospel. We thank you now, in Jesus' name, amen, and thank God. Let me thank those who join us by live broadcast. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shuremont Road, Houston, Texas. If you're ever in the Houston area, come by and visit with us. Continue to tune in on Wednesday at our 720 broadcast. And if you're in the Houston area, come out on Wednesday night at 7.15 and join us. And please continue to tune in on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We tune in at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live on, on Sunday morning. But join us in our 1030 service. Amen? Thank you again for joining us. If you want to donate to this ministry, you can do so by our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. Thank you again. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.